uh, welcome to our session, Metrics, Metrics Everywhere, from which ones I should be scared. So it's a fun title. Unfortunately, it's a very serious conversation. And if a company has gone through a breach or some type of incident, it can be very serious and very scary and very hard conversation to have as well. But our promise to you is that we are going to try to keep it on the positive note. Um, and we'll try to take you from the data collection, from data points to meaningful upset measures, all the way to how we define and we support our application maturity levels. And with that, um, the abstract for people who, who may not be attending the conference, a couple of acknowledgements and disclaimer slide. Um, neither me, neither Surgeon um, are affiliated with any of the vendors um, that we may mention, services, product offerings. Um, the session is not intended to provide advisory. We share our uh, personal um, examples, results that we have seen, and our opinions are not the opinions of the companies we work for, not of our employers. With that, about the speakers. Now, I've been building DevSecOps and um, data protection practices from scratch, but that's not important. Let me tell you what, it's coming up. Um, I'm very passionate about Gen AI, and I started a series called Gen AI Primer, um, we did one in August for Gen AI Primer for Cyber, cyber Tech. Um, another um, Gen AI Primer for DevSecOps is also posted on my LinkedIn profile. We are talking about a podcast on um, Gen AI Primer for AppSec. And hopefully the first week of December, uh, John will help me to do uh, uh, Gen AI Primer for threat modeling as well. So keep, keep stay tuned on this. Surgeon, introduce yourself, please. Hi, everybody. It's super loud. Uh, so John Roldrick here. I'm a technology executive, but I'm also a practitioner. Uh, I love AppSec. I've been building AppSec and uh, data protection programs. Um, but I love cybersecurity and cloud native. I'm all about the cloud native. Well, and what Surgeon didn't tell you is we're writing a book right now on cloud native security. Hopefully January, you all have an opportunity to read it. And with that, uh, our session today, very quick scroll through the agenda. We'll talk about the AppSec metrics, what metrics are good to uh, collect, what not, um, how to measure, how to improve the application security, a deep dive with real world examples, a lot of tips and tricks within the um, uh, AppSec measures, um, measurements, um, talk about tooling, challenges, best practices, and we'll finish the conversation with the uh, AppSec maturity uh, models uh, and some ideas on how to keep pushing the envelope for the AppSec um, maturity. And our session is kind of a title from vulnerability to victory with AppSec metrics to where we want to go. So why the AppSec metrics matter? And by the way, I don't think you need to take pictures. I will um, uh, will have the slides posted on the LinkedIn profile so you, you can download it. I believe in sharing at least. Just make um, a good face for Raj. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they, okay. We'll feel like yeah. We'll feel like uh, um, like uh, actors today, like celebrities. And we'll do that as well. Okay. So, um, why the AppSec metrics matters? Well, for example, if you don't want to see your company's name on first first page of Wall Street Journal, company name dash bridge. That's a good idea, right? AppSec metrics? Okay, not a good, not a good joke. Um, let me try again. Um, you want your boss to know such a good job you're doing can give you this next promotion? That's why we need apps. Uh -oh. That's why we need AppSec metrics. Okay, let's forget about the jokes then. So let's talk about um, specifically about the improving and how exactly we're improving the customer. Um, the company security posture. Um, we are talking about uh, preventing or reducing the numbers of possible incidents. We are talking about um, measuring the effectiveness of what we do day in and day out. Um, we also talk about something that's very, very important today. We are talking about the value of the AppSec to our consumers. Um, 
I presented at um, Digital Trust Conference of ISACA, and they had a lot of research there done how consumers today think about the security of their data, the security of their vendors, and how this today can influence. Now, it's a paradox because the same exact people, they'll freely give up all of their um, personal data to social media. So this is a paradox. I'm not going to go into this one. But yes, the consumer now thinks about the privacy, thinks about the consent, thinks about the security. So this is one implication. The second implication is the third party vendor trust. Um, so if you're a third party vendor to somebody, um, I helped a lot of companies to up up their um, third party vendor assessment. So they today include a lot of questions about application security. Um, and of course, when we start talking about cyber insurance, previously cyber insurance didn't care about up or upsec. Now there's a lot of questions. So if you have to apply for a new cyber insurance or maybe raise um, certain amounts, it will be much easier conversation if you are prepared with your upsec metrics as well. So this is another very important point. Now, another thing that it's a soft criteria, but I always recommend that uh, we should be thinking about how to build um, security culture. And up met upset metrics are a very good way of building the trust and the uh, upset culture. So um, I have two analogies about the upset metrics usually. One is the fire alarm. It rings before something bad is happening exactly, right? So it's a, your uh, alarm on that. And also it's a car. It's taking you from one spot to another, from where we are currently today to where we want to be tomorrow, and we can define the speed of uh, what we want to do. So what metrics to collect? Of course, very easy conversation here. You guys have to collect relevant metrics. And of course, you're going to say, oh, oh what does so she mean? It's like, well, how it's very easy, right? Well, what is actually relevant for me? So we have the selection criteria on the right, but forget about it for the moment. Work through me through the slide. Um, we are talking about concentrating on the re relevant, the metrics that actually will help you to take action. Uh, this is a holistic approach because you are going to have technical, process-related, business metrics, and all of this at certain point will collide in one um, common spot. Um, also, pay attention to non-obvious, um, Surgeon's going to talk about that a little bit more, and custom-created metrics. And I got an example for you, the one that actually yesterday came from the conversation at ThreatMod.com. Um, so there was a company that I worked with, and they wanted to do threat modeling. And of course, the answer of the management was, great idea, but maybe next year. Go argue with that. So what they did is they created their own metrics, which was audit findings that have to be fixed, let's say, by October 31st, Aud number of audit findings that need urgent remediation, so we be, will be in compliance, per number of workflows that will be impacted that need to change in order to satisfy these audit remediations. Now, this is a non-traditional, non-obvious, but very useful metrics, and they did get the money for their threat modeling because they were able to prove that if we have a threat modeling tool, this is going to help us much faster, more reliable, cheaper, and will meet the deadline. Right, so don't be, don't be afraid to create for yourselves the metrics that, that are relevant to your company, actually. Um, another example to the left is about how we connect the dots between the entire software supply chain. Mm -hmm. Um, if your developers are using Jira, GitLab, GitHub, whatever they're using, if they have hooks into Slack and all of the development information is going there, there's absolutely no reason why the security finding, the security metrics shouldn't be associated in the same way. And everybody would be on the same page. By the way, the developers are actually used to looking at these things. Failures of tests that should be passing should go the same way. Um, metrics that you want to show, for example, Introdu introduction of new vulnerabilities. I mean, of course, every company is trying to stop the bleeding at a certain point, right? So no, no new SQL injections or cross-site scripting should be introduced in a new code. If you start seeing such things, everybody on Slack should be able to see it. Does it make sense, right? It does. So. so it's shaming people with, no, with metrics, oh. right? <laughs> it's not a shame, it's a fact. Okay. Um, so it's okay. what metrics not to collect? Uh, is this slide about. Metrics that are 
too expensive or time consuming to collect that are not going to pay back for your work. We all have such metrics. Uh, metrics with low, low relevance, the so-called vanity metrics. Um, metrics that might be misleading. What about a metric called total number of vulnerabilities? 27,372. Is that too much, too little? Okay. What is their severity? What is their, um, you know, how should we prioritize? Well, are they externally facing, internally facing? Um, metrics that don't provide exact um, valuable insight for me. Um, for example, compliance metrics. Uh, compliance people don't shoot. Uh, I don't mean that we are not collecting compliance metrics, they're very important, but they have to be connected. They have to come together with the security, their secu relevant security implementation. Otherwise, they don't have a specific value to us, right? So again, this value statement is changing. So just because you uh, can collect a lot of stuff, that doesn't mean you should. Uh, my advice to you for this slide will be always try to get the context, meaning number of these related to ABC or number of these or total number or average time based on blah, 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 right? So always try to put those in context. That, that, will, be, that will always save you a lot of time and will make sure that you keep your meaning as a shortcut. And with that, I will leave you with Sir John to delve deeper into the metrics world. Thanks, Maria. All right, so we all know that AppSec program just creates a lot of, lot of data, right? We have volumes of data. Um, we have code vulnerabilities. We have third-party libraries. We have container uh, image API security vulnerabilities. Um, so how do we make sense of it? Um, I put together a little bit of a framework here that, that we can we can um, start getting a handle on 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 our, our data and turn data into metrics. Really, that makes more sense. So obviously, first gotta collect it. Um, automated collection is preferred, um, and we can automate processes over time. Just make sure the process is is right to begin with, because automating a bad process is not helping you anything, um, then um, what do we need to focus on? We need to prioritize. Um, um, and then rem remediate based on prioritization. Uh, you, we need exception process in place where we, um, we can't remediate everything. And sometimes there's no patch, there, there's no, not enough time, there's not enough expertise. We need to get a little breeder to be able to um, remediate vulnerabilities, um, then as an indication of how we're doing in our AppSec program, we need to track things over time. Um, that it's an indication of how effective our AppSec program is and to make a business case for your um, AppSec program, to develop it, to mature it, or, and to you know implement um, fixes and Communication is just the key to all of your stakeholders, um, to business, to leadership, to developers. It, it, it really is the most important thing. Yeah, communication upwards, communication sideways, communication downwards, of course. But the most important thing here is this. If you come and I'm your CISO and you come and say, eh, well, we haven't got a problem, and nah, 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 nah. so you better give me the, the, the meat. You give me the facts. You're asking me to take a risk for something. So I would like not to just take a blind decision. I would like to, again, as much as possible to make an intelligent decision based on as much as facts I have. So that's the value of having the metrics where, where you're communicating. Doesn't matter which southeast, northwest direction, okay? So again, we come to the point of, of um, how do we get started? So at first we have to master the basics, right? Um, Number of vulnerabilities may not be super useful, but it gives you an idea about the size of the problem. Um, it's something you can start with. Um, then we can start prioritizing based on severity. Um, if you wanted to get an idea about um, how fast are we remediating, uh, number of vulnerabilities per 
result per sprint would be a good place to start. Um, newly, number of newly introduced vulnerabilities. Um, if you just say month over month, we're having two, three vulnerabilities, whatever, right? 300. <laughs> um, you can, you need to make a finer distinction whether are those vulnerabilities that you already found or, or they are newly discovered or uh, what, are you, what, what is your um, cadence of resolving them? Um, once when you master the basics, uh, we can start getting more into, into the depth where we have um, uh, more important measures uh, like mean time to resolve, um, like mean time to acknowledge. Sometimes the, the finding of vulnerability is they're just sitting and not being picked up by anybody to resolve it. Um, it's important to understand the timing and then fix your process, right? I mean, all of these things are there as a data point, as an indication for you to find um, more intelligent way ab about doing your technical decision, right? Um, so some of the non-obvious uh, or, or important measures uh, to get a feel for, for your AppSec program holistically um, and, and to, to drive these initiatives, um, let's say we want to do threat modeling. We need to actually track number of threat models we do and the findings, it, it, uh, the issues reported. Um, we want to do code reviews, we do the same thing, right? All these things need to be tracked. Like what is the number of true positives uh, in when it comes to findings? Like all these tools, they produce a ton of false positives. We need to be able to tune them, right? All of these numbers need, need are some indication of what to do, right? I mean, you know that. Well, that's hopefully right. the vendors are going to take care for the <laughs> tuning, <laughs> not we have to go and tune it, which we all have done. Um, but l from the non-obvious um, metrics, I have one favorite one. It's a technical depth, the classification of a technical depth. This, I think this is very important because the security is usually a big portion of the technical depth. Um, so this is one of my favorite non-obvious. My suggestion to you, uh, not necessarily to do it, but if I have more than 5%, between 3 to 5% is my personal tolerance of new defects, new SQL injection, new cross-site scripting, especially if it's a SASTI. Now, if it's a little bit more complex, dusty or something that's different, send the developers to a class. And please, when you exit, take a green, green or red and put it into the, into the <laughs> cup, please. Okay, especially if you're exiting early. We want to know. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, so um, having this internal training for the teams that are introducing new uh, vulnerabilities, and especially if there are specific type of vulnerabilities, I think this will be very, very actionable and very relevant for you guys. And it's a human, again, because you're helping people that are struggling in a certain area. Again, it's no fault, no point of fingers, but it's an actual help, it's actionable help. And so what Sergio's gonna finish this slide, I would assume, yeah. is we got the numbers, but what do they mean? Keep going. All right, so when it comes to prioritization, we, we, we really want to um, use, uh, we have a several goals, but we want to prioritize uh, vulnerabilities. We want to measure effectiveness of security controls. Uh, we want to track overall security posture over time. Um, we really need to be using a risk approach. Um, we need to consider, always consider compliance requirements, but again, security is not compliance. Or compliance is not security. You know, we, a lot of people do like checks. Um, you know, security by check check marks. It's not uh, a good idea. But um, metrics can really help us build a case to um, to implement proper security um, app security program. And this is where we really need to get in the buy-in from the stakeholders and show them the numbers, right? Um, so. How do we know how are we doing, right? Um, we we need some goals. We need to me to measure the effectiveness of our AppSec security program and, and the metrics. Um, typically, we have SLAs, SLOs, and OKRs. SLAs are uh, service level agreements. They they can be really legally binding and functional. And um, so. Example of it would be uh, publicly available uh, products. We we need to have only z like a zero vulnerabilities at every every release or um, any kind of disclose disclosed vulnerability. Like if you have a uh, voluntary disclosure program or or bug bounty or anything like that, uh, any kind of um, vulnerabilities need to be resolved in ten days. 
um, th that, uh, that is an example of SLAs. Um, like um, OKRs, on the other hand, um, these are have to be very specific um, to, to drive our um, SLOs, right? So th there's a connection between all these measures. Um, we can also split the, the SLOs and SLAs between code ones and infrastructure-based ones. So here are some examples. We have um, on the host side, we have like critical 72 hours, high 30 days, and so on. I don't need to go into these, but this is just an example of how to take the temperature of how we're actually doing with our um, security program. Uh, risk considerations. So everybody needs to understand, and, and a lot of security practitioners do, that um, everything in the enterprise is based on risk. Uh, risk appetite, uh, you need to be able to communicate that risk to your CISO. That communicates everything to the board of the directors, right? So they probably have quarterly reports that they have to, um, you know, com what what is our <laughs> risk currently? And, and are we going to be okay the next quarter because um, our security investment is is adequate or we just put in $20 million and how we, you know, are we, are we any safer or not? That's something the board needs to understand. So um, these kind of communications are very important to communicate upwards. Um, very simple way to co uh, calculate risk, severity times, times um, probability times um, impact, but this is a very coarse measure. Um, we definitely need to include locality, whether something is externally accessible or internally accessible. accessible. If something is behind five firewalls, it's not going to be as uh, relevant as something that, that, that is um, being pounded all the time on the, on the outside. A um, lot of uh, companies take the next step and calculate the risk based on the indirect or direct damage um, or prob of the probability of attack. Um, and, but once when we put in all the security controls, we, we put in the um, process improvements and mitigations, and um, this also applied to accepted risk. Whatever is left over, it's residual risk, and that needs to be also communicated to your CISO, so it can be communicated to the board. So this is something uh, that is very important. Um, you can always enhance your risk scoring through aggregation, contextualization, quantification, and prioritization. Um, and this is a final slide. Um, that talks about the, the communication, right? So we need to select the metrics, collect, summarize, um, analyze, visualize it in a way that, that your stakeholders can understand, um, really tailor your communication to your uh, stakeholders, um, and be pr prepared to answer these questions because the stakeholders also have other, other uh, business people are probably asking them the same questions. How are we doing? What is our risk? Um, so be able to communicate those kind of things to your stakeholders is, is a paramount. So one thing that is important um, when we are talking about selecting measure um, metrics, so we already spoke, okay, select the metrics, create your metrics, customize whatever it's needed. The same approach we need to have about our stakeholders. Who is the right stakeholder and what is my communication channel? What is my communication path to my stakeholder? Right, you have business lines. Business lines, in most of the cases that at least I have worked, they don't want to hear anything. They don't want to know anything. They're saying, oh no, that's not my problem. I don't care about that, do I? Oh yes, you do, and this is why you do. Um, you need to have the proper language, the proper visuals. Um, you need to, again, going in front of the board and start bubbling about the d propensity or a density of uh, vulnerabilities, and it's not going to help that much, right? So we need to have the proper language to um, proper communication channel, proper and proper stakeholders to select properly, and the, the way to communicate with them. A development manager who is who is in, in the, on the hook to uh, ship the release immediately or as soon as possible or at the minimum on time is not going to be very open to discuss with you how we can delay the, the, the release with two weeks because we have so many security problems, right? So we need to find this common ground of collaboration as well. 
Um, so the communication is scarce, but we need to prepare everything up to the communication and to prepare for the communication itself as well. With that, world examples, real world examples, uh, we are gonna do no metrics whatsoever, bad metrics, improper metrics, incorrect metrics, and finally good metrics. So um, the background of, of the first example would be, um, we were actually, um, it was a, fi a large financial company and newly established um, AppSec program all of, all of a sudden you have 20,000 vulnerabilities, five people to remediate, it's not really going to work um, because the number of vulnerabilities keep growing. Um, so typical thing we do is try to stop the bleeding, um, isolate the problem, uh, prioritize vulnerabilities and then start remediation. So this is what we've, what we've done. Um, so we implement the WAF, um, segmented the application network, um, prioritized, then started prioritizing um, and, and uh, vulnerabilities based on, on uh, severity, locality, and, and exploitability. And that really cut it down to about 300 or so, um, much, much, uh, much more manageable. Um, so who's here familiar with Log4j? <laughs> As expected, everybody knew, <laughs> knew about that. So um, what happened here is um, basically uh, thing happened on the news and, and um, it was like nobody knew what, how the big the problem is. Where do we even have Log4j? Um, so it was all hands on deck, pan total panic mode. Um, so I'm sure everybody has seen something like that happen. Um, so right away, stop the bleeding, right? We block the log4j attack, WAF, EDR, um, disallowed message lookups, um, patch up third-party applications, and then aggressively scan and remediate. Um, this, this is something that, that the, it's very difficult when you don't have the AppSec program in place. Um, you don't have the data, you, it's, you have no idea how the big problem is and that the unknown unknown is is, is the, the scariest of them all. And all of our CMDBs are perfect, right? Oh yeah. Absolutely. Like 100% compliance, right? Even if they exist. <laughs> so when it comes to incorrect met metrics, uh, if you track things that don't matter, uh, like for example, um, number of alerts or number of alerts linked to violations, um, issues left at the end of each month, day, month. Um, it really has no risk context, no, um, not tied to any incidents, um, you not even prioritized per severity, not enough granularity, period. Um, this is a bad example, and, and it's good to know what's good and what's bad. Um, when it comes to good metrics, uh, one of the things that we can use metrics is really, really to test the effectiveness of our security controls. Uh, this is an example where, where we have, um, we use a MITRE attack framework, um, like we have five out of 10 TTPs are, uh, are being only being detected, so which means that they're not be the five of them are not being detected early enough until later in the attack chain, which is a bad thing. Now, that means that our detecti detection controls are not in place. So the solution is to enhance uh, access controls, um, add segmentation, fix um, endpoint security, and bam, you have um, the early foothold attempts are detectable. So this is one, one way you can, you can actually imp you know, tie your metrics to actionable uh, events and be able to act on and improve your security posture. Um, Which also means you're validating the controls that used to be, need to be inside. And something you need to and do over, over, and over, over and over again as well. Yeah. Okay, so now we are starting to talk about tooling. Um, I would assume that everybody has sussed us the SCA, at least the basic um, scanning. Uh, doesn't matter if you have a vendor or a third party, um, maybe open source. 
the problem here is that there's way too many tools. Um, and some vendor does, does only do, and then I need another vendor to fill up the gap. Um, so ma managing vendors is also hard. Um, I personally tried, even in 2019, 2020, we tried uh, IST and RASP. Uh, we also need to scan for containers at deploy time, at runtime. So some of those are actually scanning um, at deploy and runtime. Um, WAF, uh, if you have implemented, and for example, your WAF like ThreadX has a SOC team, good collaboration with those team internally with your Thread management team. Um, if you have such with uh, the CM team that you have. So this is a very great internal uh, collaboration. Um, just keep that across the entire software supply, uh, supply chain. Um, now, for all of those tools, our major requirements are going to be what? Very, very uh, simple uh, and very standard, I would say. To be easy to use, easy to integrate with our current environments. Maybe GitHub, GitLab already have pre-integrated tools within it. I'm not commenting the quality of this tool so far, but we are saying it's an integrated developer experience. And I think that the developer experience deserves a couple of minutes to talk about, um, because think about it. If I am sitting currently in my development environment, I'm writing code, I'm remediating, doing stuff, then I have to leave my, my, my environment. I got to go to each one of the scanners that we are working for. Then I have to go back to my environment, maybe run a new build, maybe go back to see, oh, these are false positives. Let me mark them as false positives. Oh, I need to wait for the upset person to mark them because I don't have permission to mark them into the scanner. So all of those going back and forth really hurts the developer experience and productivity. So we need to be conscious about that. So, um, of course, less false positives, false negatives, um, and, um, you know, the total cost of ownership sometimes get way too high. Total cost of ownership also can be high if you have an open source for which you don't pay licensing, by the way. So you have to be careful when you estimate on the total cost of ownership. Now, something that is very, very helpful is um, the so-called AppSec security orchestration and correlation tools. Um, I've worked with quite a few of them. Uh, I'll mention 2018, actually, it was the first tool. It was called Zero North and then got acquired um, Kenna. Um, and I think here we have um, Armor Coat is one of our, um, one of our um, sponsors, Armor Coat. I see Raj. Raj is hiding. Hopefully, it doesn't have a reason to do, to do so. Um, so we expect um, those tools to provide a um, unified uh, um, view from all of the findings, uh, from all of the scanners across the tool chains, something very, very important, uh, and to help us to prioritize in a holistic manner. This, this actually gives us the capability to look at the product risk as, uh, as a whole. Right, so that's why I think this is very important, and this is just one example. So challenges and um, with AppSec metrics. Um, a lot of data, or maybe not enough data, lack of standardization, lack of focus, maybe on, we focus on quantity rather than on quality, uh, maybe failure to prioritize, not enough people to do and to manage our highly complex distributed systems today. Uh, maybe we don't have a proper uh, stakeholder, just lack of stakeholder, or maybe improper communication with the stakeholder, a uh, buy-in, um, sometimes difficulty to measure where we are today. So there's a lot of, a lot of challenges. And so the approach to challenges is just one. Uh, it's this holistic view that we try to describe to you um, from the beginning of the session in terms of standardization of what we measure, how we measure, the contextual information, one thing, part of, number of, related to, or depending on, um, and the integrated process across the entire DevSecOps tool chain. Now, best practices. I have an example of, um, I just uh, went to um, AppNox and put one of their examples um, because we didn't talk about mobile security, so I didn't want you guys to feel that mobile is in, in excluded. It's obviously included. Um, and these are their best practices for mobile security testing for developers. Uh, by the way, the seven is much brighter because they're on their website, this article has a wrong chart. Six and seven are the same, so I had to correct it based on the article. Um, but um, this kind of a teaches you that this customization, this personal approach to what your organizational needs are, are very important, and also per the type of the application. 
So we still have to define our goals. We still need to, to select the right metrics. We still need to establish a process of collecting, storing, analyzing, discarding metrics, right? Summarizing, providing visuals, communicating with stakeholders, um, making sure that we have this base for a valuable, um, in intelligent way to make a decision. But my statement to you here is going to be that if your organization is security empowered, we are going to have clear goals met with clear relevant metrics. This is the, the key to success to any AppSec um, program, if you ask me, my personal opinion. Now, the next couple of slides, and we have about five minutes before we go to questions, are going to be how the AppSec metrics define and drive application security maturity. We talk about this example, hey, I have a car brings me from here to, way to where I need to go. Um, the areas of strength and weaknesses, we know that um, based on the AppSec metrics. We track the progress over the time. Uh, we make the informed decision based on data that is actu actionable data uh, for, from our environments. We know how to communicate. This is our digital frontier, and this is how we power and drive forward our application uh, security maturity. Now, this is a, a topic that um, I'm really passionate about, and we talk about maturity models. So I listed the four that are probably the most uh, um, kind of a common here. Uh, we have the OAuth SAM. By the way, there will be a great training, I think, Wednesday this week uh, on SAM. Um, so if you guys are interested in that, definitely um, sign up to attend it. We are talking about um, if, you, if your company is using CMMI, um, that might be a... Uh, framework to go, BISM, NIST, of course. We're talking about measuring flexibility, TCO, ease of use. And still, although I have the selection criteria listed here as well, you're going to ask me, OK, OK, enough. What maturity model is right for me? And my answer to you is going to be this. Simple enough so you can implement it with your existing skills, with your existing budget, but complex enough to push you forward, to c help you to grow faster to where you need to be. So we at the Purple Book community, uh, we are quite passionate about that. Purple Book community here, members, <coughs> clap for them. Um, so we worked um, specifically um, this year, one of our initiatives was devoted to the journey to AppSec maturity. Of course, AppSec is a journey, it's not a destination, we all know that. Um, and we were thinking about a way to hands-on engage with the software security and development teams um, and to create these powerful educational resources, but also keep in mind where I am uh, over three specific dimensions, which are going to be people, process, and technology. So we came up with something that we called S3M2. Uh, this will be uh, scalable software security, S3, maturity model, M2. Um, and we define those five levels from very reactive to quite proactive. Yeah, not to be uh, confused with S3 buckets, right? <laughs> no, please. Uh, so um, we have an event tonight. Um, if uh, you guys would like to join us, uh, I think we have still a couple of spots uh, left uh, that, that people can sign for a dinner and bingo. So it's a fun, it's not just work. Um, but the reason we want to communicate closely with you guys is because we kind of created something that apparently has value, but we want to define it, we want to specialize it, we want to make sure that we provide the best value, then we can publish it. And by the way, even before it's published, um, we have a couple of companies that um, would like to take it forward already, uh, would like to take it to customers and start implementing it. Now, this does not replace the existing maturity models. Let's not make this mistake. This is an easy and practical way to assess where you are today and to help you to define where I need to go tomorrow based on my industry, type of uh, uh, applications, data, etc. Um, so that's about the S3M2. And to finish up, um, I always want to have kind of an actionable slide where to go. And this can be a week, three weeks, six weeks. This can be 30, 60, 90 days, uh, three months, six months, a year. But the path that we want to take with AppSec security 
and specifically with the metrics, is to review the policy standard procedures that our company has. Maybe they need updates. Maybe they're not perfect. Maybe we need to update them. Usually we review them and update them yearly. But sometimes we, we go so fast, our business changes so fast. The threats are changing so fast. So we need to be in support of this. We can't be lagging. You know that security usually has been a kind of a blame that we are the stick in the wheels and we are driving along and we are only creating problems and we are not agile enough. So we need to be this driving force for that. Um, we should define the maturity of the AppSec programs for our uh, company. Where do we need to go to socialize this with the stakeholders, to identify the relevant metrics and create a roadmap? Right? And once we have this roadmap and we are sure that, hey, we are on the right path here, we can actually um, start executing on it and try to support the pushing the envelope for the AppSec. Um, being intentional, being relevant, again, I, I can't stress this one enough. So in a nutshell, we are assessing our AppSec maturity at each phase of the SDLC and across the SSDLC, the secure software development lifecycle test our systems, reviews our policy, make sure everything matches there. We are applying consistently our controls, striving to raise the bar, to push and to sustain our application security maturity, and of course, innovate. Innovate with your, um, with your metrics. They're your best buddy, best tool to ensure that we are going into the right direction. And with that, thank you very much for joining. Don't forget to put the little pieces in the cups, and um, we can open for a couple of minutes for questions. <laughs> and no hard questions are allowed. No questions? Oh, guys, come on, come on, okay. Um, I'll personally post them on my LinkedIn profile where all the other slides are shared. Um, I'm sure, um, actually, OWASP is really good at uh, recording the sessions and posting them as well. Um, so follow up on that as well. Yes. Uh, you never mentioned the CK74. So I have my special opinion about scores. <laughs> um, but yes, um, the ex uh, how, the way I'm generalizing, and you, you can correct me if this is not what you mean, is the exploitability. Um, so the exploitability is one of the most important items when we think when we do the prioritization. How, how much risk this is for us. Um, and unfortunately, um, on the development side, um, they're not going to look at that. They're going to look how much time it's going to take, take me. So um, I would usually push this one from the AppSec or a um, Champions program. If you have AppSec Champions program, Security Champions program, this will be your best bet for people to actually explain that. Okay, you can get hacked in the next five minutes. And if you don't understand that, then you know, we need to talk in a different way. But uh, again, um, you need a little bit help there from uh, more qualified people on those. That would be my advice to you. Uh, John. So that's not a fair question because the threat modeling expert is asking us to answer questions on threat What models. do you think? Um, so I would greatly, uh, uh, greatly encourage you to mention a few of those and share a few of those with us. I, I think um, it really matters, like, what, what is your goal, right? If you, if you want to um, do threat modeling ad, uh, ad adoption, right? So that, that, that's, I was just going right. to say, adoption is one. Right. This is a great example of, of customized metrics. Customized right? like, and non-obvious. Like what do you want to track? Okay, non-obvious. Track and it customized. over time, and then you you intelligently formulate it in a way that that is tied to risk, is tied to other things. Right, 
Great discussion. Thank you. Correct. Could you say a little bit about more or a little bit more about that and what that looks like? You mean the accelerating like of a threat the, model? Yeah, like the story. Like yeah, so the story was really that um, you know, somebody in the very first finding was about network segmentation. Okay. Right. They had a bad account support. Uh, the application accounts, they were not properly created, not properly managed on top of everything else. Um, and so uh, the basically um, the audit remediation suggested was specifically you need to do better network segmentation. And so when we, we went to talk to the networking people, they were like, well, so you have this here and this here and no, 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 this, and I don't even have a flow and I don't even know what your application does and stuff like that, right? So having designed a threat model over this process where everybody's, you know, the application people were tossing the ball to the networking people and networking is like, oh, I don't know your application. And then turns out that there's actually a critical database that was accessed by, from this server as well, right? So having this put, put on a paper so everybody can wrap up their head around it was priceless. There were just not millions of dollars, nothing could have, could have you know, pay the price for such a thing. And it um, facilitated the collaboration, facilitate the clear picture of, hey, we are in so much trouble. The audit didn't even tell us in how much trouble we are. Right. So we kind of got creatively behind it and we were able to do that. We were actually able to get our existing systems and basically get them into a model, uh, old, uh, by the way, old architectural diagrams that haven't been updated for the last five years. Of course, the software has been changing in this time. New accounts have been created. And so, but putting this one in one visual place helped us I immensely. That's the story. Yeah, and so you were able to derive key metrics from, from all of that. that all of that, in huge impact. If you don't have a tool, um, you can use some of the free tools that are available just to get you started. Yeah. Even if you start with the whiteboarding, this is still something because immediately everybody's gonna say, oh, what about this? Oh, what? no, no, this is not, you have it wrong. No, I don't have it wrong. I are, are you, uh, do you lot of, do a lot of coding? I used to. Yeah, there is, there is PyTM, right? Py. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Py. We, yeah. we expanded on it, so. So don't forget if there's spots to sign for the event tonight and come and collaborate with us. We appreciate your experience. We'll share our experience with you. Let's make something that the whole world can use. Thank you for joining us, guys. And always questions, LinkedIn, you can always message. Thank you.